Yes, Your Honor. And that the prosecutor has broad discretion to enter into plea agreements and sentence agreements, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and that we, and lots of cases talk about this. I'm not saying this for the first time. It's part of our, our jurisprudence and our form of government. Is that the prosecutor uh, must be free to determine which charges and sentences best facilitate the performance of the duties of office. Agree? Yes. Yes. And you're urging me, in fact, to rely on uh, the prosecutor's determination that this sentence agreement is will best serve uh, the community, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, but I'm sure you also agree that if I simply rubber stamped it, that I would be uh, not exercising my role as a trial judge, that I would be, um, oh, what's the word? Abdicating my role as a member of the judicial branch, right? Right. Judge, I certainly don't think that you have been in the process of rubber stamping anything okay. in this particular case. Very good. All right. And it's interesting to note, you know, the prosecutors, and I've read the sentencing memorandums, is that the prosecutors make all types of decisions as to why they go forward on certain charges or not. For instance, in this case, I fully understand why the prosecutor has decided not to go forward on the felonious assault and domestic violence because that's not their strongest charge. You know, I'm not making any determinations of what happened. What happened is a, is a, um, it's very sad uh, that this happened between two people who uh, knew and, uh, one another for many years and presumably loved one another, um, at least at one time. Um, and I make no judgments to that, but I think it's fair to say that, as prosecutors often do, they dismiss certain charges based because they just don't feel they're the strongest charges. Correct? Is that right, Ms. Lindsay? That is correct. Okay. Um, in this case, one of the charges that the prosecutors agreed to dismiss is felony firearm. And that was enacted by the legislature before I became a prosecutor in 85. Um, and that carries a mandatory two years in prison when people are convicted of crimes in which they possessed or used a weapon. There's a couple of exceptions, but it, uh, it, it applies to this particular crime. Is that right, Ms. Uh, Lindsay? That is correct. All right. And if Mr. Um, Smith were to have pled guilty in front of me, because it was agreed, we talked about it before, he satisfied all the elements of those two crimes when he pled guilty. Um, but if he were to have pled guilty in front of me to those two crimes, and I would have said, you know what, Ms. Lindsay? Um, I don't want to sentence him to two years in the Michigan Department of Corrections for a felony firearm. I'm going to dismiss that charge and only sentence him to probation for or with jail for the for the uh, destruction of property crime. Um, I can't do that, can I? No, you you cannot do that. That's right, because the prosecutor has the discretion to dismiss those charges, right? Correct. And um, it would be a violation of the separation of powers if I were to undertake that function, wouldn't it? Correct. And if I were to do that, I'd get reversed, wouldn't I? You wouldn't like me, yes. I think I would. Okay. But it's different. The prosecutor has the, um, as the uh, chief law enforcement officer of the uh, county, um, the prosecutor can do that in her discretion. And um, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So then we go to the, the crime of um, malicious destruction of personal property. And the guidelines are such that I could, um, uh, you know, if there was no sentence agreement, um, um, I could sentence them to uh, probation, jail, or a prison sentence within those guidelines uh, without giving any reasons to do so, doing so. And they say that even if the guidelines are advisory, the court should still start uh, from the guidelines as a starting point. Uh, but um, 
uh, a prosecutor in their uh, sentence agreement discretion, uh, they don't, you know, they could go above or below the guidelines, and that's sufficient reason um, for a plea agreement, uh, whether it's in or without the, the guidelines. Uh, so I really, the, the question is, what am I going to do with the uh, my sentence on the uh, um, malicious destruction of personal property? I know that the prosecutor provided a number of reasons uh, when we were here at the plea and talked about them in the uh, um, sentencing memo. Now, one was that the, the court has, uh, the prosecutor has limited resources, wants to use those resources for uh, more dangerous people. Uh, two um, was uh, due to Mr. Um, Smith's mental health uh, issues, uh, which I have not seen any of the records, so I can't pass on that. I have to leave it to the discretion of the uh, prosecuting attorney who received those from the defense. Um, um, and I don't want to minimize them, uh, but uh, the information I've been presented with, but it seems to me that Mr. Smith has engaged in some impulsive acts. Um, Another reason that was given at the plea had to do with embarrassment of the parties. Um, and I said, that's a valid reason, although I sort of, in my mind, I don't give it much weight because I know that the complainant was, uh, uh, that the defense used a text message at the preliminary examination. Um, no, one, you know, no one asked me to make a ruling on whether or not that type of information would be admissible at trial, and certainly with uh, the felonious assault and domestic violence uh, dismissed, I'm not sure that any of that would have been admissible anyway, you know. But, you know, and another reason had to do with, uh, I talked about with the parties, had to do with the jail. Um, there is uh, limited money. And we all know is that even in the criminal justice system, prosecutors, uh, judges, sheriffs, everyone has to make the best use of the limited amount of resources, uh, particularly here in Wayne County. Uh, and I and I know I said, well, is Mr. Smith going to engage in any particular program at the, while well, he's at the jail? And the answer is no. Um, and I question that. But you know, the prosecutor has just as much right as I do to have an opinion on the best use of the resources. And I, I you know, whether I agree or disagree on that particular issue, you know, doesn't, you know, you know, is not, you know, I basically what I'm saying is I trust that she takes those things to a, into account, uh, just like all of us in the criminal justice system, because we're, we're all trying to have the um, do the best job with the limited resources we have. And it's clear that, uh, as Ms. Lindsay pointed out before, that on the night that this occurred, that Mr. Smith was a danger to the community. Even though he only shot up the car, he shot up the car with a semi-automatic rifle. He fired multiple rounds on a residential street. And I'm no expert, but I know that, you know, and I suppose a car is a big target, but when you fire a gun, you never know where the bullets are going to end up. And they present a danger to everyone else in the community. So it is fortunate that nobody was injured uh, as a result of Mr. Smith firing the gun. That I recognize that as the defense and Ms. Lindsay have indicated in a joint sentencing memorandum that they believe that this is a fair sentence and that Mr. Smith is not a danger to the community now. That they believe that the likelihood of, um, what's the word, of him engaging in criminal conduct again is unlikely. And uh, certainly, uh, simply because maybe I have a different uh, thought about how to best use the resources in terms of jail or prison, it would be it would be arbitrary of me uh, to um, not follow the sentence agreement simply because uh, the prosecutor has a different opinion about how to best use the resources. <laughs> so, and we also know, as we talked about before, is that if I don't go along with the sentence agreement and sentence Mr. Smith to a more severe sentence, that he has a right to withdraw his plea of guilty and go to trial. Is that right, Mr. Dillard? Yes. Correct, Ms. Uh, Lindsay? Correct. Okay. 
just as if I were to decide just to give him straight probation, the prosecutor would have the right to ask to withdraw from the plea agreement and go to trial. Is right, Ms. Lindsay? Yes. Okay. All right. And, um, you know, there's all types of case law about the different roles of the prosecutor and the, and the, and the, and the trial judge. I'm not, a, I'm not the prosecutor's supervisor. Um, prosecutors are entitled to uh, the presumption that they act in good faith for the reasons of sound governmental policy and prosecution. And I have no reason to um, believe anything other than that in this case or any other case. And I do know that although Ms. Lindsay has indicated before uh, somewhere along the lines about um, the unusual that felony firearms get dismissed when guns are fired. I had a case here last week, although the facts were different, a man fired a gun in his own house after getting into an argument with someone else in the house and hit the wall. He had been charged with felony firearm and the felony firearm there was dismissed as well. So um, I do know, and I don't remember each and every case because it's impossible to remember each and every case, that this is not the first case. Uh, that the prosecutor has dismissed the felony firearm charge in exchange for a different sentence. And I note um, that I received the joint sentencing memorandum that both parties asked them to adopt the sentence agreement. So, I'm going to do so. Well, uh, let's say I'm going to adopt the, uh, the sentence that's uh, here. So, for the crime of malicious destruction of personal property in the amount of $20,000 or more, it's a sentence of this court uh, that Mr. Smith be sentenced to five years probation with the first 10 months in the Wayne County Jail with no early release. So let's talk about some of the other conditions. Okay. All right. Um, you must not use, possess alcoholic beverages or other intoxicants. I guess I can simply say you must comply with all statutory requirements of probation. Do you need a second, Mr. Dillon? Okay. Very good. All right. Um, and you know you must not enter bars or other places where the primary purpose is to serve alcoholic beverages for drinking on site, unless the field agent has given you, first given you written permission for your employment at a specific location. And you must comply with the requirements of alcohol testing. All right, now one of the, the agreements, uh, or one of the things that it says here on the probation report is that he must comply with the requirements of drug testing as directed by the field agent. And uh, that means um, no marijuana as well, no controlled substances unless prescribed by a physician, I guess. And I do know, uh, based on the pre-sentence report, that Mr. Smith has a medical marijuana, I don't know what they call it, they call it a card? Right. Okay. Um, you know, we have a law that allows people in this state uh, that, um, that was uh, passed by a referendum, I think, by the vote of the people. Uh, that people should be allowed to use medical mar mar marijuana for medical purposes. So the question to me is, is um, Mr. Smith in this plea agreement giving up that right during the period of probation? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, there's people that are writing about that now uh, because normally judges say no controlled substance use. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, based on the, the parties, if, if, and this isn't being done, isn't an issue of punishment. Uh, this is really an issue of uh, treatment. And the question of whether or not uh, the um, alcohol issue, whether it would be best helped along by saying no marijuana. Well, obviously, Your Honor, the reason why he has the car, it was that there's some determination that, that the marijuana assisted uh, in its treatment. Um, you know. It, it's a tough question. I, I really haven't thought about it, but I, you know, I do think that if well, let me ask. It says doctor says it. it says alcohol and drug treatment. I mean, that was part of the agreement, right? 
and I can't uh, order, dr and part of uh, drug testing um, comes along with alcohol and drug treatment, and um, if we're going to test, if we're going to test, you know, you know, I guess basically, uh, if I'm being told that uh, the medical marijuana is, is uh, in, uh, I can't do drug treatment, and I can't do drug testing. Um, so it looks like it's part of the agreement. Is Mr. Smith willing to give that up uh, during the period of this probation? Well, I, I think or the parties you're simply, asking him to make a medical determination. Or the, parties, for it. Well, or, the, or the parties simply want to address this with me later on. We can address you later on okay. if it comes up. All right. In this case, I will um, uh, not order uh, drug treatment. I'm not going to order drug testing at this particular time. Uh, well, I suppose when, this, when this agreement was entered into, no one knew, obviously, because the first time I found out about the medical marijuana was uh, when it was in the pre-sentence report. Um, I don't see why he cannot be tested for other controlled substances. I mean, even though they test for a marijuana also, I don't see why that would preclude them from testing for other controlled substances. The, the author of this pre-sentence uh, investigation report, uh, if I understood her correctly, because I asked her about this, said that, you know, if I um, allow him to use the medical marijuana as long as he has a card, uh, that they can't do the drug testing. Can we take this up at a, sure. at a later date? Sure, we can sure. take that up at a later date. Okay. I don't know that that's a reason why the prosecutor would move to set aside withdraw from the plea of guilty. Or is it? Um, I'd have to consult. So. Okay, very well. Okay. Uh, in any event, the this particular right is really an individual right um, of Mr. Smith, all right? Um, so. So, but he will be ordered for alcohol treatment? Yes, with okay. monthly documentation, a mental health evaluation with full compliance with treatment and monthly documentation. Uh, the weapon's already been surrendered. Um, so you've seen the, um, the um, recommended uh, conditions on page two of the PSI. I didn't receive any objections to them. He must not have any verbal, written, electronic, or physical contact with Anistia Thomas, either directly or through another person, and he must not be within 500 feet of her residence, school, or place of employment. We, we absolutely have no problem with that, yeah. All right. Okay. So, and he must comply with DNA testing and pay a $60 fee. He must pay $68 state costs as ordered by the court. There's a crime victim's assessment in the amount of $130. A probation supervision fee, which is determined by his income, and that's $8,100, which must be paid at the rate of $135 per month. There's court costs of $1,300. And the weapon's already been surrendered. So. And again, all statutory requirements. Oh, I know what I wanted to order. I wanted to order that he, um, I think it's uh, pursuant to uh, Michigan Power Law 771.3 probation conditions, and that is 1P. I hope I have the right. Reimburse the county for expenses incurred by the county connection with which the con uh, conviction for uh, probation was ordered as provided in the Prisoner Reimbursement to the County Act, uh, which is Public Act 1984-118, uh, Michigan Power Law 801.81 to 801.93. And my, um, I've got that right here. It says the county may seek reimbursement for any expenses incurred by the county in relation to a charge for which a person was sentenced to a county jail as follows. For each person who is or was a prisoner, not more than $60 per day, for the expenses of maintaining that prison. Okay. So that's that's the um, part that I'm ordering mm -hmm. as a condition of probation. Um, and obviously, uh, that's all um, based on the 
ability to pay. Okay, so In a joint sentencing memorandum, I know that Mr. Dillard has uh, told me that I should treat Mr. Smith the same as anybody else, because I asked a question about whether or not a public servant should be treated more harshly or differently. And he's, uh, and, um, and on page eight of the joint sentencing memorandum, it says, here we have a plea and sentencing agreement that provides punishment, treatment, opportunity for rehabilitation, and deterrence. This resolution also protects the privacy interests of the complainant as well as the defendant. In addition, because of the defendant's status, there are additional collateral consequences which most defendants never face, i.e., the requirement that he resign, from his, resign his elected office. Against this backdrop, it can hardly be said that the plea and sentence agreement here is violative of the public interest. So, So I have a question. What do the words, in addition, because of the defendant's status, there are collateral consequences which most defendants never face, i.e. the requirement that he resign his elected office. I note that because in the sentencing memorandum that was filed jointly by the parties, and signed by Ms. Lindsay, Mr. Dillard, and uh, Mr. Evelyn. Uh, Mike's just got the electronic signatures. Um, but there's no citation to any statute, any constitutional provision, or any case law. So what do the parties mean by that, Ms. Lindsay? What, is, what does that mean? In terms of? It, it says here. Well, I it think. Says, it says, this is what it says. What page? It, yeah, page yeah. eight. It says, in addition, because of the defendant's status, there are additional collateral consequences which most defendants never face, i.e., these are the words that are significant, the requirement that he resign his elected office. What does that mean? And where does that come from? Because there, no one gave me any citation uh, to go look up uh, in the Constitution or in the statutes or in the case law uh, to find out what this means. Maybe, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I'm asking, Mr. Dillard, what, is the, what do these words mean? Well, the way I interpret it is it, it's, it's a part of the plea agreement. The prosecution, in its, in its discretion, required him to resign from office. Okay. So it was an, it was an additional requirement, not set forth in any statute, not set forth in any constitution, uh, that we had to, that we decided to accept in order to uh, reach an agreement. Okay, so if I understand correctly, um, we agree, because we already talked about the separation of powers, right? And so do you agree then that there's no statute or constitutional provision that requires that he be removed from public office because of this conviction? Do you agree with that, Mr. Doe? Uh, I'm not sure about that, Judge, in terms of if he's convicted that he has to resign from office. 
Okay. There, are, there. Are, I do know that there are, there are, there are rules and regulations within the legislature. You don't. The bottom line is you don't know, right? Correct. Okay. Miss Lindsay, do you know the answer to that question? It, Does he have to resign from public office because of his conviction? Putting aside the sentence agreement. It was my understanding that he did not. There's only certain. There are only certain uh, crimes for which uh, they can remove him. I don't think he. he he would be automatically forced to resign. I, I think agree. there are certain things I, that would force him, uh, force the body sure. to remove him. I don't, don't think what he was convicted of would be one of the crimes that the body would sure. be forced to remove him. I agree with you. And you know, you didn't have a citation. I can't tell you how many hours I spent trying to find out the answer for this question because I kept thinking, I must be missing something. I, and I looked at the, I, I spent hours. <laughs> yeah. um, Judge, Dr. Miller, it, it has to be connected with something to do with I'll office. get there. I'll get there. I'll, I'll let you know when I need some more help. Because I looked at the Michigan Constitution, Article 7, 4, Article 7, Article 4, Section 7. And it says, no person who has been convicted of subversion or who has within the preceding 20 years been convicted of a felony involving breach of public trust so shall be eligible for either house of the legislature. Well, this isn't subversion. Subversion means basically trying to overthrow the government from within. So it's not subversion. Agree, Ms. Lindsay? Correct. Agree, Mr. Dillard? Yes. Okay. And it's not a breach of the public trust. Agree, Ms. Lindsay? That is correct. Agree, Mr. Dillard? Yes. Because this is a private crime. Now, this is a malicious destruction of property. The legislature terms it a crime against property. Uh, and they have a whole separate section of what they call crimes, a breach of trust. And, you know, the, you know this crime didn't happen in office. Uh, it's not like he, like he went on a, you know, and smashed the podium of the Speaker or the House or whatever, the Senate. And, in fact, there is a... Um, Attorney General opinion that I found. Let's see if I underline the appropriate section. It doesn't really matter, but it, it supported that conclusion. <clears throat> so there is no law or constitutional provision that says that Mr. Smith must forfeit his office or that he forfeits his office because of this conviction. So, it seems to me that putting aside the sentence agreement, that Mr. Smith is eligible to serve in the Michigan Senate. He's still in the Michigan Senate, right? Okay. Yes. All right. With this felony condition, it appears to me that he's still eligible to serve in the Michigan Senate. And In the Michigan Constitution, Article 4, Section 16, it says that each house shall be the sole judge of the qualifications, elections, and returns of its members, and may, with concurrence of two-thirds of all the members elected, thereto and serving therein, expel a member. So it seems to me that the uh, Constitution for Michigan reserves to the Senate to decide whether or not to expel a member. Thank you. 
Now, there was a case, that, another case that you were involved with, Mr. Eva, um where someone agreed to resign from office. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. The constitutional provision that you're referring to, which I provided Ms. Lindsay when we were negotiating this matter, is sometimes referred to as the Kwame Amendment. Ah, and, and, and in fact, in that case, Mr. Kilpatrick also negotiated a plea where he agreed to resign the office of mayor. But, but that doesn't apply to a state senator. No, in fact, that, that statute, that constitutional provision was adopted in the wake of what took place with Mr. Kilpatrick. Right, because they're, they're right, right around that he didn't, he's not required to resign. Let's, when we're talking about different people, we should use the name first so we know what he we're talking about. He's not required to resign. The, the, he's not constitutionally required to resign. Okay. So, and, and even though part of the sentence agreement with uh, Kwame Kilpatrick was that he resigned from office, uh, he fell under the city charter, Correct. Uh, which has a separate provision, although I'm not positive it had it then, 2.107, that with, with talked about the grounds for mandatory forfeiture, uh, that the office of an elected city officer shall be forfeited for the following, uh, and then it says, plead to or is convicted of a felony while holding the office. Judge, and I worked on that case, that particular case. I didn't, I didn't mean to forget that. Uh, I didn't know. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and then the, the other statute that you're referring to, because um, that was adopted afterwards, uh, uh, Mr. Evelyn, was Michigan Compile Law 168.327. I'm not positive if that's, no, that's Kathy yet. It talks about, that talks about the governor's removal. But I just want to make sure, because it's an important point to me, uh, to make sure I understand that there's neither the Constitution nor any statute or any case law um, says that Mr. Smith must forfeit, it, forfeit his office by way of this conviction. Correct. That's okay. correct, Your Honor. I spent a lot of time looking at this because no one spelled it out for me, and I was confused. I, all right. So let me ask. Since the parties agreed to this uh, aspect, since they agreed that Mr. Smith would resign from the state senate, does that mean I should impose it? Yes, because that is a condition of, of the agreement. That is what was bargained for, and that is uh, a condition. That was one of the conditions that made the plea offer. Those were the terms that were agreeable for us in order for us to discuss this. Yes. Mr. Dillard? What exactly is the question asking? Okay. All right. Maybe I won't ask any more questions. Okay. Because, you know, and the reason why I ask these questions is that I kept now I know I'm not missing anything. But the parties are asking me to impose the, the condition that he resign his office because they agreed to it. But I'll say here, and, and I am not, um, I'm not pretending to be a constitutional scholar. I had to spend a lot of time trying to figure this out, in part because I'm doing it all by myself. And I took a look at cases that were, you know, really not, they weren't, you know, Michigan cases, but I looked at, um, uh, and I'll put them on the record so that the record shows them, United States of America versus Frederick Richmond, which is at 550 F605 from 1982 for support. I looked at John Leopold versus the state of Maryland, which is found at 216 Maryland Appeals 586. And... So we go back. All right. I even read a case called, Let's see if I got the full site, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. versus Robert McCormick, who I believe was the um, Speaker of the House of Representatives, and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was an elected representative who was being denied his seat. 
And I don't need to go on all the all of that because it's really not it's a little different. But the, the the part that I liked was when Justice Earl Warren wrote in his opinion, and he was citing back to Alexander Hamilton, one of our founders, is that a fundamental principle of our representative democracy is in Hamilton's words that the people should choose whom they please to govern. Now, I understand that Mr. Smith, when he pled guilty, he gave up certain constitutional rights. He gave up all those constitutional rights, the right to a trial, um, all that goes, goes in there. Who does, does Mr. Smith have the right to agree to give up his seat in the, in the Senate? in exchange for this guilty plea. Does he have the, does he have, is that his constitutional right? I don't think so. I think that belongs to his constituents, the people that elected him. Or, or all, right, I should say really, his constituents, everyone who can vote in that district, regardless of whether they voted for him or not. It belongs, that right in the, um, um, in the Constitution about his being expelled belongs to them. They can choose to vote for him, or they could choose not to vote for him. The other way that someone can be expelled is, is they, they can be expelled pursuant to the Constitution with a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Now, um, I think I heard that, um, that, and I'm no expert, that the, he, Mr. Smith was stripped of some of his, um, whatever they call it, um, help me with the word, Committees. Thank you. Committees, seats, or designations. All right. So they have the the power to punish them, and they have. And the Constitution has said that he can be expelled. You know, all they have to do is give a reason for doing so. He's not. He doesn't forfeit his right to. He has a right to sit. He's still eligible to sit as a senator. Uh, but the the Senate could um, vote with a two-thirds majority to expel him, and then you have to put down the, put this down in, in the log or whatever, the ledger. Um, but we know uh, that that's a pretty extreme um, action. I mean, we know just from watching current events what happened recently with uh, two representatives, uh, Gamert and Corson. Uh, one, you know, how long that took. The, uh, um, and it was, I guess it's never certain, whatever. Uh, so, It would be illegal for me to impose as a condition of sentence that he resign from office and that he not hold public office during the pendency of this probation. It would violate the separation of powers because I'm a member of the judicial branch and the Constitution provides for the removal a way that uh, uh, legislators can be removed. Now, I, so, you know, so there's really three ways. Expe ex being expelled, two thirds majority, um, you voted out of office, or I suppose someone could resign. But, and, and let me start right here. I don't think that prosecutors were these intention was anything but benign. That she had the best interest of the community. I don't think anything other than that. Um, I have no reason to believe that. And um, I go on that premise, I, I'm confident when I say that, okay? Um, but that doesn't change things. Um, because, um, you know, she doesn't have that power under the separation of powers. She doesn't have that authority to do that. And when someone, when we start abusing that type of authority, look, look at the way that the impact that a prosecutor could have on the structure in the, uh, in the, in the Senate uh, by saying, well, listen, if you resign, uh, we'll reduce charges or make a certain sentence agreement. I'm not saying that that was, that prosecutor, the prosecutor did that here, but it was made part of the sentence <coughs> agreement. 
And so this type of agreement is, is fraught with, with danger um, if this court were to allow it. And his voluntary consent to this doesn't cure that because he doesn't have that right to resign in exchange for this in this sentence agreement. It belongs to the people. This constitutional provision uh, that I've read about uh, removal from office uh, exists not for the personal benefit of legislators or candidates, but the safeguard of the rights of the people. And that comes from the Richmond case I cited before. This agreement here, in this case, subverts both the authority of the Senate and that of the defendant's constituents. It's against public policy, as I indicate, by using a technique that has the possibility of executive or prosecutorial domination of members of the state legislature through forced credit resignation. Again, referring back to um, Richmond. It is, they said in Richmond, it represents an opportunity for an assault on the composition and integrity of a coordinate branch of government. And again, it doesn't matter that the prosecutor's intention was benign, because as they say in Richmond, the availability of this technique and the possibilities of its abuse cannot be tolerated. I, or I should say the court, no more than the prosecutor, has the, the power to remove itself in the removal of congressional officers, or in this case, state officers, or to foreclose their candidacy, or their um, uh, being allowed to sit in office in the future. So, The portions of the guilty plea, in this case, pertaining to Mr. Smith's resignation from the Senate and the prohibition from him serving um, as an elected or appointed officer during the uh, pendency of this uh, probation are void because they represent an unconstitutional interference by the executive, the prosecutor, with the legislative branch of government and with the rights of Mr. Smith's constituents and interfere with the, the separation of powers. However, and I want everyone to listen. I just want to make sure that uh, the lawyers aren't talking so that they can hear me so if they have questions with regard to what I say, they got it. Mr. Smith's plea remains valid, okay? With regard to everything else in his plea. Um, however, the aspect of the plea which required him to resign from his office and uh, not hold public office or appointed office during his probation offends the state constitution. It's contrary to public policy, compromises the integrity of this court, therefore it's void no um, it forms no part of the judgment of sentence. So, I think I have covered most everything except for the advice of rights. And so, uh, Mr. Smith, since this is a conviction following a plea, you have the right to ask the Court of Appeals to review this case and to ask for a lawyer for that purpose of public expense if you do not afford one. The request for a lawyer must be made within 42 days after sentencing. There's a request form containing an instruction informing you that it must be completed and returned to the court within 42 days after sentencing if you want the court to appoint a lawyer. My guess is we didn't get you that form yet, but we will. So I know that Mr. Smith was listening to what I said, and I trust that you understand that my ruling here means is that 
you do not have to resign from the Senate. You, I'm taking that off the plea agreement. That's void. I took that out of the plea agreement. It's not part of my judgment of sentence that either that you resign or that you not hold public office or elected office during your probation for the reasons that I've said. Now, I don't, I don't know um, you, what you choose to do personally is not for me. Um, but I want you to know that based on my ruling, it's your choice whether to resign or not. It has nothing to do with this agreement, not, not part of the judgment of this court. That's a decision that you will have to make, um, I'm sure, upon uh, deep reflection. Um, you know, I don't judge you. I don't judge Ms. Thomas. Um, people do make terrible mistakes. We hurt other people. Um, there's some punishment here. And then you move on. And hopefully we're all a little wiser for it. And I hope that, um, I hope Ms. Thomas heals. Um, and um, I know that I don't need to lecture anymore in terms of your knowing the mistakes that you've made. Uh, I don't need to go on about that because I know that you understand. Um, so um, let me ask. It's uh, late in the day. Uh, I don't have any of the paperwork filled out. Um, what do you want uh, to do or what do the parties want me to do about um, a day um, for us to finish the paperwork uh, and Mr. Smith to uh, turn himself in, or do you want us to take him to the... Yes, we certainly would like to have a couple of days to do that. Okay. All right. And uh, do I um, hear anything from... Uh, um, with regard to the... Um, um, so, you know, I put aside the marijuana issue, but I did not um, sentence... I didn't order all the conditions of the sentence agreement. Um, so I don't know what if anyone wants to say about that. Are you asking me to set aside the uh, agreement, Mr. Dillon? No, Your Honor. Okay. I, would have, I would have to consult. Okay. I can't make that determination okay. right now. You know, I, I would just indicate now, as I did before, that I don't think that the prosecutor's intention was anything but benign. I can't well, I, I understand that, but I can't speak to the issue as to whether okay. the court, whether we should uh, move to withdraw the okay. agreement or not. So I have but, but I would say that um, that it, it would not be in the interest of justice for me to allow this plea to be uh, withdrawn uh, if the prosecutor were to make that motion. I don't, haven't seen her. You know, maybe they'll find some case law that says I'm wrong. Something's wrong. Uh, but I think it was a, uh, that part of the agreement was illegal, and that's why uh, unconstitutional and void, and why I uh, made it void and not part of the agreement. I, and that along for the withdrawal of the plea agreement under this situation uh, would not be in the best interest of justice. So, when do you want to come back? Uh, Tell you what. Um, I didn't bring my calendar. I'm in trial all this week, so. I, I, I have one. I have a problem, Judge. My uh, daughter uh, has won a prestigious award, and they will be on between the 18th and the 21st that I need to be pregnant. That's that weekend, uh, this weekend. So do you want to come back before? And, and I guess um, in light of the fact that Mr. Smith is still in the Senate, um, the parties should add, indicate to me whether or not they're going to ask me to do anything else uh, with regard to the sentence that I've imposed, with regard to any other condition. Okay. So while we come back Thursday, at least for a doctor conference. Thursday. Uh, Oh, you're in trial. I'm in trial. Okay. A homicide. So. And you're leaving the 18th? Yes. Okay. And, uh, You'll be back when? Well, it's 18th to the 21st. Let me just 
look at my calendar real quick. I, I think I could be back by the 23rd, Judge. What day of the week is that? It is a Wednesday. That should work. Okay, so but let me just make, I'll be shrouded in this building, Judge. So okay. just let me just make one check just to make sure. There may be, after I speak with the prosecutor, there may be another condition that we can substitute in, so that's what I'm saying. I know what the court has indicated, but. I, I have, with the, I have, um, well, I guess I won't prejudge anything until I see it. Okay. Um, but um, I think I've spoken pretty loud and clear on what I think and what my ruling is about the requirement that he resigned from the Senate. I understand that, but I am not the prosecutor. Okay, I understand that. All right. Judge, I'm sorry. I just looked at my calendar. I do have a doctor's appointment on this one. So we'll do it for that. It's good Friday. It'll be, we're only open until well, noon. It's going to be jammed. No. Okay. okay. All right. I, I, I'll adjourn it, Judge. So you'll come on this, what, what date did we say? Well, we said the 23rd. Okay, I don't care if we come on the 28th. The yeah, well, that's fine. I would like the 28th. Okay, okay. 28th. All right, okay. what time would you like to come? I'm pretty easy to go along with. Uh, I like the afternoon, Judge. Yeah. Two o'clock is fine. Okay, two o'clock. All right, and um, if you're gonna file anything, uh, I want it filed at least, um, a week before, okay? Okay. So that I can read it all. And, uh, and Mr. Smith, I'm sure you understand um, and that you comply with all the conditions of probation. The ones that I've imposed, right? Okay. Okay. During recess. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lundy.